So we're looking at the matter of, especially in Hebrews 3, 16 to 4, 11, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. First, believe under residence, then be faithful unto enhanced eternity. We read Hebrews 3, 16 to 4, 11. We're digressing a little bit and going forward, uh, backward toward Since these are believers, toward the previous chapters, the first warning, don't drift away from faith in Christ, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. No, drift away means you had to believe. And people get all uh, worked up about false professors or apostate. doesn't matter relative to your eternal destiny, your residence in eternity. It's going to be heaven. Now, we're talking about the promises uh, and uh, the rest, especially in view, the Hebrews are looking would be looking at the rest of the promised land. They haven't occupied the promised land in the way they should have. We've just looked at a couple of places, especially Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, about the new covenant being fulfilled over the old covenant. It hasn't been done yet, and it's Israel... House of Israel, House of Judah are the only parties involved in with God. And they enter that rest, <clears throat> the promised land, in toto, perfect, sinless beings, mortal bodies, know the word of God perfectly, ministered in the promised land, they will then occupy and receive the rest that is uh, declared for them and promised for them. But God's going to do it all by his grace. He gave Israel all these years of a chance under the Mosaic law, to see if they could qualify. And he could not, did not. None of them ever uh, had a chance of 100% belief. Acts chapter 2, no. Acts chapter 3, postponement. We had the church age. So they didn't get to the rest <clears throat> all throughout the ages. And finally it says, uh, Hosea 1 and 2 says, 1, 1 and 2, you're no longer my people. But there will be a future generation where you will be my people. And that's what we're talking about here. The first warning, don't drift away from faith in Christ, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. In chapter 1, the author explained how vastly superior Jesus was to anything in creation, especially angels. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? And, and we'll be like him. So we will, will be vastly superior to the angels. In chapter 2, the author drew an inference beginning with, therefore, dia tuto, from Christ's superiority, arguing that since Christ is greater than the angels, the Hebrews should give earnest heed to what they have been taught about him, lest they drift away from faith in Jesus. <laughs> you can drift away from your faith as a believer. And we're starting with the Hebrew believers. The Greek word for drift away also appears in Proverbs 3.21. <clears throat> and when it does this. Where, in Proverbs 3.21, the Greek word in the Septuagint, where it suggests a gradual departure from the truth. David Allen points out that it is a nautical term, Hebrews 6.19, that evokes the image of a boat that has been become unanchored and is slowly drifting away at sea. <clears throat> the author could see that the Jewish believers were at risk of slowly drifting back into Judaism, formalized, legalistic Judaism, which cannot be a means of salvation, obviously, which would put them in danger of God's judgment, though. They wouldn't lose their salvation, but they will be receiving severe judgment. In that way, there's an analogy between the law and the gospel. For if disobeying the law, the word spoken through the angels, incurred consequences, uh, just reward, so then, so would neglecting the great salvation of the gospel. You turn away from your salvation through faith alone in Christ alone, you're liable for discipline. The question is, what kind of salvation were the Hebrews neglecting? First, we shouldn't take salvation as a technical term, meaning salvation from hell. If you check your concordance for the uses of save, sozo, and salvation, soteria, you'll find that all the Old Testament uses and the majority New Testament uses, this is the Greek Septuagint when it refers to the Old Testament, translation of Hebrew into the Greek, about 4 BC, 2 BC to 3 BC, referred to deliverance from the life-threatening dangers, not to salvation from hell. For example, Hebrews 11.7 speaks of Noah's household being saved from drowning in the flood. 
But salvation could also refer to future events like the second coming. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Hebrews 9.28, emphasis added, also cross-reference to Romans 13 and 1 Peter 1. So we shouldn't assume that salvation always means being born again. The nature of the great salvation needs to be identified from the context. Second, the salvation the author had in mind was still future. We know, we know that everlasting life is a present possession. So what's this future thing? And it's talking about Hebrew believers. But the author said that the salvation he was speaking of would happen in the world to come. Hebrews 2.5, Hebrews 1.14. That future expectation would align with his statement that Christ's second coming is a salvific event. What are we preserving, saving, delivering from? Okay. Third, the Old Testament quotes leading up to this warning and immediately following it emphasizes Christ emphasize Christ's future messianic kingship. Hebrews 1.5a quotes Psalm 2.7, a royal enthronement psalm that ultimately points to the enthronement of the Messiah. Hebrews 1.5b quotes 2 Samuel 7.14, which refers to the Davidic covenant and the promised heir to the throne, which is also a reference to Messiah's rule, millennial rule. And will Israel participate according to the new covenant, which hasn't been promulgated yet? Hebrews 1 6 quotes Psalm 97 7, which refers to the future reign of the Lord when he will vanquish his enemies and be worshipped by all. Hebrews 1 7 quotes Psalm 104 4, which is a creation psalm and points to the Son's power and sovereign rule. Hebrews 1 8 9 quotes Psalm 45 6 7, which describes a royal wedding, wedding, the Messiah's eternal throne, and introduces the important concept of his companions who share in his rule. Who do you think they're talking about? The church. Us. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 quotes from Psalm 102, which speaks of the Lord appearing in glory to rebuild Zion and ruling forever over the nations. Hebrews 1, 13 quotes Psalm 110, 1 to once again emphasize the Messiah's right to rule, being at God's right hand, and his victory over his enemies. As you can see, there's no mistaking the point the author is making. All these verses point to the glory of the Messiah, his rule, his victory, his future kingdom. And... By the way, how we participate with that, depending on which dispensation uh, and uh, which uh, group of people within that dispensation. Fourth, Hebrews introduces the concept of believers as companions, metachos, of the Messiah. This is a key theme through the epistle, throughout the epistle. The Hebrews are called companions of a heavenly calling of Christ, of the Holy Spirit, and of God's discipline. F.F. F. Bruce suggests calling believers companions carries a special meaning in that it points to their participation in the Messianic kingdom, ruling with Christ. So you want to rule with Christ, make sure you enter that rest, that particular rest. The Jews, class of Jews, at that second coming, church is already in heaven. That Jew and Gentile composition, coming back with them in the second coming, we'll see what happens, that the, the uh, new covenant will be fulfilled in mortal Israelite humans transformed into long-lived human beings, perfect, perfectly sinless, perfect knowledge of the Word of God, to participate and enter the rest of the Promised Land and rule the nations of the world, co-ruling with Christ from there in Jerusalem. Given these reasons, there is a strong case to be made that the great salvation the Hebrews were neglecting was not the message of how to be born again. They were already born again. Bible study manuals comment, they, they already were born again Believers, as this letter is addressed to them from the beginning, as the immediate context above indicates in italics, with all those pointed points there, tasted of the heavenly spirit, Holy Spirit, and so on. But the good news about Christ's future kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and on in eternity, which was the main subject of the Lord's teaching between his resurrection and ascension to heaven, Acts 1 3, if believers become indifferent to that future salvation, there will be consequences they can't escape. However, the author does not tell us what those consequences might be. Second warning, be diligent to enter God's rest. That's what we're looking at now. Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 13. The second warning concerns the concept of entering God's rest. The author drew a parallel between the Hebrews' correct current situation and the dark events described in Numbers 13 and 14 chapters when Israel rebelled against God. And they lost their 
being God's chosen people at that time, those generations. You'll remember how the Lord commanded that men be sent into Canaan to spy out the land, only to have ten or of the twelve men come back with a negative report, warning about the imposing size and strength of the Canaanites, as if the Lord was not greater than all. Fear gripped the Israelites. They refused to enter the land to take possession of it. They wished they had died in the wilderness. So they didn't enter the rest. Occupying the land under the authority of Christ, co-ruling with him, ruling with the nations, knowing the word of God perfectly, and being perfect human beings, long live. None of that happened. Some even wanted to find another leader to take them back to Egypt. For God, that was the last straw. Israel had murmured and grumbled before, but now they had made an irrevocable decision. <clears throat> Although God forgave the Israelites their sin, Numbers 14.20, they still had to face an, a penalty for their rebellion. God decreed that with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, everyone over the age of 20 would die in the wilderness instead of entering the land. They didn't enter God's rest for them. They didn't trust in him. They were Many were saved, but they didn't enter the rest, and they died physically, early death. By recalling this event, the author of Hebrews invoked a principle about God's judgment. Arnold Fruchtenbaum explains it this way. I guess I'll move that down. The principle, put a quotation mark in there, the principle in Scripture is that once a point of no return is reached, the offenders are subject to divine judgment. The judgment is physical, not spiritual. It does not mean loss of salvation. In fact, Numbers 14.20 does say that the people repented. It even goes on to say that God forgave the sin. It did not affect anyone's individual salvation, but the physical consequences of their sin did need to be paid. Consequence of not entering the rest. Once the point of no return is reached, no matter how much repenting one does thereafter, the fact of coming physical judgment cannot be changed. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the issue is physical death, and loss of temporal blessings, but not loss of salvation. So they did not enter the promised land, and they died before they were able to. Like Israel, the readers of Hebrews risked facing a similar penalty because they were on the verge of their own irrevocable rebellion, as described in Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13. So the author warned them that since Jesus is greater than Moses, the penalty for rebelling against him, going back to the law, especially Hebrews 6, would be worse than the ex they experienced by Israel. The Hebrews were warned that they should not harden their hearts as in the rebellion. The Israelites did not enter God's rest, and the Hebrews risked the same fate, fate if they departed from the living God. The big question is, what is God's rest? Does it mean the Hebrews were, were at risk of not entering heaven? No. Does it mean they were going to miss out on eternal life? No. The evidence strongly suggests that, once again, this is a reference to the Messianic kingdom. There are three reasons for taking it that way. First, the concept of rest had a Messianic meaning. The Israelites who entered Canaan never possessed it fully, so they developed a Messianic expectation that God's promises to them would be completely fulfilled in the future, and that's still yet future, but very close. That's why the author explained if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. He was 4 8. There was another day coming when the Messiah would establish his kingdom in the land, finally providing an ultimate rest for the people of God. Second coming. This has in view the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel alone of the new covenant as stipulated in Jeremiah 31 31 to 34, which study has in view all of the generation of Israelites, yet future, trusting alone in Christ alone and being transformed. Let's see if I put the link in there. Oops, back that up. Check the link. It should be New Covenant. Yep, go there. It's an eye-opener. I was told if I did this study and focused originally, primarily on the Old Testament to get the point of view because it came first, and then see what it says in the New Testament, the Greek Bible, I would God would kill me. I, people are just nuts about this misinterpretation. The new covenant with Israel, house of Israel, house of Judah alone, transformed perfect human beings many, many, many hundreds of years, 
right? And live out the millennium.